The Merchant Sales Podcast is brought to you by Valor Paytech, the payment technology company that is revolutionizing cash discounting. Valor Paytech is a processor agnostic solution with all of the omni-channel features you're looking for, standalone terminals, mobile devices, desktop, gateway, e-invoices, all with cash discounting and surcharging in mind. I would encourage you to take a moment to get a free demo of Valor Paytech. Head over to ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R, to get your free demo today and to watch videos and read information about this amazing new processor agnostic omni-channel technology solution. So Patty, great episode today with Ben uh, talking to us about offline mode and this idea of using cell service with POS systems. I was actually kind of surprised by this one. I, I learned a lot about it. And as, as you'll see in the, in the podcast, it's sort of, to me, it's like an up system for your POS device. Yeah. I Only think it's, it's not, it's not power. It's internet. Yeah. I love it. I thought it was pretty cool. And then I actually really enjoyed the part where uh, Ben was even talking about some of his challenges as an entrepreneur and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it'll resonate with our audience. Um, with the questions from the field, I'm talking about from the perspective of a <clears throat> sales manager or ISO owner or executive, should they have their sales team be 1099 or W2? Question I get asked right. all the time. Next week, we're going to dive into the sales reps perspective. But if you are building a team, this is something I think you should listen to. Maybe it'll give you a little bit of a different perspective. Yeah, I think so. And then in the insider's report, I uh, give us the uh, preview for the holiday shopping season. I mean, it's it's amazing that we're there already, but uh, there's interesting some very trends. interesting stats out there. It's not going to be a bust. I think it's going to be a good holiday season. I agree with you, Patty. Especially small retailers. Definitely. Well, good stuff. Well, with all that said, let's dive into our interview today with Ben. Let's go. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey, everybody. We're here today with Ben Robinson. Ben is the director at Aperon. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, so Patty and Ben and I are going to discuss this idea of offline mode, this idea of running transactions when there's no internet connection. Uh, and Ben's company has a very different spin on it, which I think is super interesting. So before we do that, though, Ben, I always like to get a little uh, backstory. So can you tell us um, how did you get into this crazy industry? How did you end up at Aperon? Give us a little bit of your background. Okay. Um, so I umpired baseball, of all things. Okay. Okay. Uh, worked my way up. I worked, you know, high school and college, and I actually worked professional baseball for a few seasons. Um, really? Well, that's awesome. Now, okay. And while I was doing that, you, baseball is half the year, right? right. So right. you find something to do the other half of the year. Sure. Um, and initially, that was uh, doing writing copy for for small businesses doing ads and things like that. Okay. Um, it morphed into email marketing and then websites and then sure. apps. Sure. And it, so over the years, we've, we've kind of added these things. People would say, hey, can you do this? Or can you help me with this problem? Um, and eventually we got sucked into to merchant services and, and uh, you know, processing and point of sale. And, and uh, just because we kept finding pain points in that, that yeah, industry. Yeah, sure. Um, so we're not one thing. We're a lot of things. Sure. Um, and the idea is, can we keep finding uh, technologies and solutions uh, to put around these these legit small business owners right. um, to, to build value and to, to help them uh, solve some of these everyday problems? Um, so that's kind of the the history of the company, starting out with just me, you know, writing copy for cash, you hmm. know, in the off season. Wow, I love it. Um, to to kind of progressing to being legitimate small business consultants. Right. Uh, we're not, we're not out there trying to, to, you know, sell them something they don't need. We're out there trying to, to solve some problems for them. Well, you know, Ben, as, as a, uh, as a writer who, as someone who writes for cash, and someone who loves baseball, I love your story. Uh, <laughs> I figured, I was about to say, I figured Patty would relate well with your story. So, so, uh, Hey, can you, you know, talk to us a little bit about offline mode and, you know, what this is and why this is something merchants want, you know, what's the current state of, uh, you know, with the average POS device that, a you know, merchant might use this. So I, let me, I'll kind of oversimplify the, the, sure. oh, great. Um, Best. Tell a, a little story again here. And, and 
So going back a, a number of years, you all the way back to, to knuckle busters, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, that was a true offline mode. It was the only <laughs> right. Mode. That yeah. was the original Very offline. offline mode. <laughs> right. Um, uh. Since then, we, um, and it's part of the, the risk models, we want to be able to verify, right? We, we don't want to shuffle around paper. Right. And so the truth is, and, and this is kind of one of those situations where there's f facts and there's truth, right? right. When we go out as, as salespeople and we're selling a, a credit card terminal or we're selling a point of sale machine, the first thing, especially as, as we've gotten uh, into the mobile and the cloud point of sale, mm -hmm. right? Here, mm -hmm. The last few years, um, the first question they want to know is, well, what happens if my internet goes down? Right, right. And our standard answer and a standard feature now on any of the major, you know, point of sale systems or, or it, a lot of the uh, uh, standalone terminals is uh, an offline mode or in the industry, we call it store and forward. So the facts are, hey, you're covered. You have an offline mode. The truth is uh, you can't process transactions offline. Right. Uh, so the software is doing something pretty clever. It's just holding on to that that transaction, including the, the card payment information. Right. And as soon as it, it reconnects, then it's trying to put those transactions through. Right. Now, again, they might the decline. Keeps the merchant a little bit exposed. <laughs> yeah. Right? Sure. Sure. Right. Hmm. So if we let's say I'm, I'm a coffee shop and you know a group of three four five people co-workers come in one person pays for the whole thing i happen to be offline right. in offline mode i swipe the card i give them their coffee they sit there they drink their coffee they leave it reconnects and there's something wrong with that transaction right right jump fraud or anything like that it doesn't matter there's yeah. something wrong with that transaction and it's declined and they're already gone <laughs> they're already gone and so is your coffee right right, right. so it's not that that I think merchants have been misled. It's that I think that was the best technology at the time. What right. we're excited about is things have have progressed technology wise and costs have come down on, on the types of equipment that we need to pull off kind of an always on type technology. So Ben, uh, tell us, you know, what's the alternative to this kind of legacy offline mode? Uh, you know, what is your company doing that's that's different? Well, it's actually, it's very simple and it's very exciting. Instead of having to think about what happens if I'm doing a whole bunch of transactions offline. Right. Um, or kind of crossing our fingers and hoping that everything goes smooth. Right. Um, the better solution is just to keep them online. So our solution is an almost always on, I'm not going to say always because if, if sure. technology gets hit with a hurricane or something. Of course. Be, right, right. Of course. Um, but it's connecting to uh, a 4G or LTE um, cellular connection, and it's okay. connecting multiple uh, it, multiple connections at once. So hmm. um, I actually played with this device in my house. Yeah, I had a, the the little app, kind of the the inside uh, right. app to measure things that I would go around to different windows in my house, and you can see it connecting to multiple. Uh, uh, cellular connections. So the point of me saying that is it's more robust. It's not like your phone. It's a more robust connection. It's a sure. much better antenna. Um, it's not like a, a off the shelf, uh, consumer grade hotspot, like a, a jet pack or something. Right. Like Cause that's that. still uh -huh. running off of one carrier. Right. It's one carrier. Um, sometimes they're throttled depending upon the plan. Right. Um, right. And they don't stay on. It's not an always on connection. They go into kind of a sleep mode to to conserve battery and conserve bandwidth. Huh. Um, so this is a legit commercial grade uh, solution uh, where it's always on and, and it's using commercial grade hardware. Huh. Wow. That's so does that does that mean it's like always reliable? I mean, I guess what you're saying is that you know, save some natural disaster that knocks down all the cell towers, that one way or another, the merchant's going to be able to, to process online using this. Well, yes. So if some natural disaster knocks down all of the cell towers in an area, right. We're um, probably not going to be doing then you're, business. Then but. you're screwed. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you've got kind of a bigger issue than, than, <laughs> Right. You know, yeah. Transactions. But I'm just guess I'm kind of um, curious about the reliability issue. You know, I mean, 
it is going to be cellular reliability is is near 100 percent right? It, right. It very rarely do you not have any cellular service in an area. Correct. Well, Correct. Uh, well and, and to clarify, especially if you have multiple carriers, right? Like I have Verizon. Right. There are certain places where Verizon's not good or certain areas where Sprint, but if I can go off of any cell tower in the area, odds are some cell, cell service is covering, and it sounds like what you're saying is the solution you're talking about would access any of those is what you're saying. Right. So it's, it's not, yeah, it's not going to be one-to-one. Um, right. it's going to be multiple streams and it's, sure. it's able to pull in signals. It gets a much better signal than like your cell phone or like I said, a consumer grade, like a jet pack or a little, little Wi-Fi hotspot device. Right. Um, hmm. just because it's a, it's a pretty massive, um, well, it, not in size, but, sure. uh, antenna. Yes. Got it. Got it. So, um, so we talked about the reliability of it. Um, you know, one one question I have about this. So for our listeners, are which are mostly like involved in sales, whether they're managing a sales team or they are a sales person, and so they're out selling, you know, business owners on point of sale solutions or merchant services. Why do you think they should be talking about this? Is this something that, in your experience, uh, a lot of merchants want to talk about? Is it a certain vertical that wants to talk about it? What, what's your experience with like why they should actually be talking about this as a salesperson? So from our perspective, and, and we do a little bit of both, right? So we're still talking to merchants about uh, processing. We're still talking to merchants about point of sale. Mm -hmm. um, we have our own in-house point of sale um, that we sell. The thing that's most exciting to me from a selling standpoint is it starts a new conversation. Sure, right? sure. So we, we talked for years about you can't just walk in saying you're going to save somebody $10 and 43 cents a month because right. that doesn't work anymore. Right. So we right. have to talk about something different and different became integrated, right? We, right. Now it, right. it's hardware and you can do this and you can do that. Um, this is kind of yet a, uh, another talk track, so to speak. Yep. It's, it's another way to start a conversation and it's, there's a legit need. There's not any, mer you're not going to find a merchant. If you ask them the question, has your internet ever gone down? Mm -hmm. That's sure. going to tell you, no, my internet's a hundred percent reliable. It's not. <laughs> that's I like that. Actually, that's a really good question to ask. That's, that's a good, good segue to get into that conversation. I like that. Right. And, and, and to kind of, it's a, a educating type of, of thing. Hey, sure. I see that, that, you know, Clover system sitting on your counter. I see that square system sitting on your counter. Let me ask you something that that's, cloud-based has your internet service ever gone down mm -hmm. oh yeah it does but it has an offline mode oh that's that's great all right you know yeah and it, you can go talking about the declines and talking about that yeah right yeah I, I like that i like that a lot so uh, ben before we get to contact information and and more specifics about the solution for our audience i have kind of an off the wall question for you so you know take me back in time to when you were doing the umpire thing you know and you were building a business and you had these competing interests you know i'm sure business owners were calling you during the season and things of that nature you know, is there anything you would do differently? Would you have made the jump sooner? Um, you know, now that you're not an umpire and I'm sure you're just full time with this, would you, did you make the leap too soon? Is there any advice you would give people that are kind of making that transition from doing two things to just doing one thing? Um, my situation was kind of unique in that you ride baseball until the wheels fall off. And okay. then, sure. <laughs> you know, in my case, I had started doing this. And so it went from being kind of a, I, and I hate this term everybody throws around nowadays, but a, a side hustle. Yes. Um, right. To being kind of a, a bigger opportunity in right. terms of a full time, full time uh, occupation or full time career. Right. Um, but I, I think what was interesting about it, I was the reason I started off. I, like I said, I started off writing copy. Yeah. I started off doing it because it was something I was good at, and it was right. something that I enjoyed. And it was purely word of mouth. Right. Um, so if you're going to go down the path of building a business and making something that's yours, yeah. it should be something that comes from you hmm. is, is my feeling. I like that. I, I think yeah. Some people get into, especially in merchant merchant services, right? I think they get into it on the promise of money. Right. Right. right? As opposed to, hey, I'm really good at explaining things or, hey, I'm mm -hmm. really good at, at uh, you know, finding solutions and, and right. kind of piecing things together or, Hey, I'm really good at math and I can do right. a, a, an honest statement analysis. Statement analysis, Right. Sure. You know, I love that. I think that's a, I like, I like that tip. And I think it's, 
you know, like it makes me think back to when I got into all this and people would ask me, you know, why are you doing merchant services? And for me, the answer was, I love small business owners. Like, I really enjoy knowing all of the small business owners in my market. And so that was my motivation. And so there was a lot of small business owners. Like, I'll give an example. When I was starting out, one of the things I did is I had five uh, credit card machines in my trunk, always. And every merchant I talked to, I let them know that I provided free tech support. Not to my customers, to everybody. Okay? Mm. Anyone in the market. Well, obviously, mm-hmm. if they called me, and I would have it, you know, hey, our terminal's went down, our processor won't help us. I'll be there in 10 minutes. I'd come over, I'd fix the problem for them. Like, I would literally call their processor and reprogram my terminal to process with them. And um, guess what? I would come back a week later. How many times do you think I sold those people, you know, every right. time, right? So, but it, I like what you said. It's kind of like, what's your what's your underlying drive and your passion for it? So I think that's, I think that's great advice. I, I think so, um, because I'm, it, to build a business and to, to make this successful, you're going to put a lot of hours in oh, and a lot yes. of work in and a lot of days where you're you're wondering, why am I doing this? Right. Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't have a firm grasp on that, why am I doing this? What is it that I derive from this other than money? Yes. It's going to be real. That's going to be, you know, a hard few years. Yep. Yeah, sure. If you're in it for the money, the first three years are going to suck. (laughs) So you're probably going to want to give up, but uh, I love it. So, okay, Ben, let's, let's transition back real quick. So um, this solution you're describing that is kind of like a, you know, in a way, a replacement for offline mode where they have this ability to use cell service. What is this exactly? Is this a technology that like point of sale companies can integrate into their solution? Is this something that ISO should be selling? Like what, what is it exactly? Um, ISOs definitely should be selling it. Okay. Uh, so it's a, a standalone solution that there, there are some, some uh, solutions that are starting to try to integrate um, wireless connectivity into their actual hardware. Okay. Um, right. We have right. a solution that has uh, a slot for a SIM card and you can start service. And, sure. But this is kind of a plug and play. So, so the thing I'm, I guess I'm asking, Ben, is is it creating kind of like a Wi-Fi hotspot? Like, is it creating a network that any POS solution can use, or is it something that has to be actually integrated into a specific POS solution? So it's it's a solution in a box. Literally. Okay. Um, All right. It, you get a box. It's two parts. Uh, one is the the LTE adapter, uh, okay. which is just kind of a square looking antenna thing. Um, you're going to put that up as high as you can in a building. Sure. Uh, in a window if you can, but it'll go through walls in an attic. It can be outdoors as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Comes with a heavy-duty cable that connects it, uh, power over Ethernet, to a, a little base unit. Okay. And the base unit is just a pass-through. So you go from your, your existing, whatever existing uh, modem you have, mm-hmm. through this box to whatever access point or router uh, oh, you're, wow. you're normally using. And it doesn't interrupt anything with your normal service, it just detects if that service fails and it automatically switches. Really? Over to the backup. So wow. it's like an up system for point of sale. That's crazy. I'm buying yes. one of those for my house tomorrow. <laughs> right. I know. I, I was thinking That's the very great, same right? thing. I have an up system. Now I just need yeah. one for my internet. That is really cool. So I would assume there's some kind of like a monthly, there's probably an upfront cost for the equipment and then some kind of a small monthly fee. Is that right? There is. So to the, the merchant, it's a, a $50 setup. Oh, that's um, not bad. Okay. And then they, they ship the, and this is a, a, a bundle that we've put together. Right. Um, and, and then they ship them, not only the, the UMA Connect, those two parts, but also a, um, a like a very basic VoIP phone. Um, so okay. in addition to backing up the point of sale system, it'll also have um, kind of emergency phone, phone service. service. Oh, okay. Bundle. Cool. Um, drop ships it to them. It has very simple instructions. It's literally kind of plug and play. It takes about 10 minutes for it to do a software update. Hmm. Um, and they're they're up and running. Wow. Uh, so it's a very, very simple, uh, you know, straightforward kind of kind of deal. Fifty fifty dollars uh, to get started, and it's fifty dollars a month, and then whatever local taxes and, and nice. So- Wow, that's awesome. So so let's let's do this. I want to close out here with with two pieces of contact information. So first of all, um, tell our audience where would they go to learn more about the specific technology solution and and actually being able to sell this to a merchant? Where would you send them to learn more about that? So we have a little uh, button, kind of a little pop up on the bottom of our uh, web page. Okay. Um, and it's it just I think it's called agent inquiry. 
Sure. Uh, so anyone who's interested in learning more about that that product or any of the other products that we we have um, or services, sure. Um, or becoming an agent for us, right? Um, you just fill that out. Somebody gets back in, in touch with you, and, within, and give us your web address. Um, it's a peronsmb.com. So a p e i r o n s m b uh, dot com. Awesome. Great. And then um, in addition to that, anybody that might want to learn more about you, uh, maybe connect with you. I'm assuming you're, I think you're on LinkedIn. I think we connected there. Uh, where, where would they go to learn more about you or connect with you personally? Um, my, they can shoot me an email. Sure. Um, yeah, my email address is ben.robinson at apparonsmb.com. Um, or I am, you're right, I'm on, on LinkedIn and they can uh, shoot me a a connection request or a, a message. Awesome. Well, I, I have a suspicion that a lot of ISOs and agents are going to reach out to you because I think uh, it's actually pretty interesting. I, I know for me personally, uh, you know, I love the idea. I'll be one of your clients and then I'm sure many others will want to resell it. <laughs> so I love it, man. That's yeah. that's awesome. And thank you so much for taking time to share the insights with us about entrepreneurship as well as about this uh, you know, solution. Yeah, great stuff, Ben. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, Patty, as we're talking about uh, Valor Paytech, our sponsor this week, um, I don't know about you, but I've gone into so many large companies that have these multiple tip options, you know, on the right. terminal. And I and I choose one, but a lot of small businesses don't, they don't have that technology because it's not provided by the ISO, right? Right, right. And that's what's really cool about Valor. Um, you know, they their terminals actually, you know, you can have on-screen suggestions that allow you to offer customers up to four different tipping options. And you, the best part about it is that the merchant gets to set and customize that those categories themselves. Yes. Yeah, I love that. You know, it, it, that's and it's I love that part. it's such a great revenue generator for the team. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's funny for me, and I'm not saying this to be you know, it's it, this this is more an admission of my complete lack of uh, concern over money, I guess. But you know, when I go to a place <laughs> and they have these options, I always select the largest option. And, oh, and so do I. And it's always yeah. funny to me. It always cracks me up because you know you I'll go to one place and it's like their highest option is literally fifteen percent, <laughs> and then I, I go to another place and it's twenty five, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> and you know they do have usually other, but if I I'm like I'm sorry, I'm not gonna take the time to click other, type this out and whatever. It's mm -hmm. like I'm gonna select one of the options you give me. So I think it's great for small businesses to be able to kind of experiment with that a little bit, see how it impacts well, sales, yeah. you know. Especially I was thinking about it when I was when I was watching this demo. One of the things that occurred to me is high end restaurants, right? Yes. I mean, you go to a high end end restaurant and you get good service. It's not going to be a 15 percent tip. Right. You know, you want right. to kind of give your, you know, it's a it, to me, it would seem almost like an insult. <laughs> you know, right. that right. Uh, right. Well, and I think too, so, even even like having the lower end and having it maybe at ten percent as the lowest option or something, so that way right, the people that maybe right. are just going to do a really tiny tip, they might see that and be like, "Well, I'll at least do ten percent." So you know, it's right. something that can that can really help. So, long story short, this exists on Valor Paytech. Their terminals have this option built into it, um, and so you can do semi integrations with POS systems and all that. And then, of course, Patty, this also, as we've talked about previously. This is, of course, built on top of cash discounting, so you can do pay at the table. Correct. So it's going to calculate the the non cash adjustment with the you know on top of that tip as well. So it's right. really going to save the merchant a lot more money, right? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah. So let's head over everybody. You know, if you're listening to the podcast and you're getting value from it, we would really personally, Patty and I both would appreciate it if you would take a moment, pause the podcast here if you haven't already. Go to ccsalespro.com slash valor. I believe by the time this one comes out, we're actually going to have some uh, blog articles there and some additional videos and resources so you can learn more about Valor. But of course, you can also go there to schedule a free demo. So definitely head over to ccsalespro.com slash V-A-L-O-R and check it out. And now, here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. So, Patty, today I want to answer a question I get often from managers uh, of merchant sales teams. And the question is, how do I pay my merchant sales reps? Should I pay them as a 1099 or W-2? And mm -hmm. this is such an interesting question that I actually have uh, written an ebook. It's going to come out here really soon um, that oh, covers cool. this topic. Uh, it'll be a, it'll be a free ebook. Uh, right now, I've just been sharing it with my consulting clients. But you know, it's a, it's an interesting one because I think it really focuses on the wrong uh, parts of it. So let me be really clear. 
if you have a rep that's 1099 or W-2 and you pay both of them the same way, the, in other words, you pay both of them the same amount of money, they are okay. both going to be equally motivated. <laughs> okay? Sure. Make right. calling it's someone... It's talents are being paid, not, not how they're being paid. Exactly. So when right. we talk about W-2 versus 1099, there's a couple things to keep in mind that are very important. So first of all, the one of the big questions is, do you expect this person to sell exclusively for you? If so, then that would tend a little bit more towards the W-2 model, okay? Because sure. especially if that's going to be kind of a requirement, this idea of exclusivity in 1099 agreements, it's just, you know, I don't want to say it's not enforceable. I'm not an attorney. This is not legal advice. But as a, as a you know, individual that sees what happens in the industry, it's not enforceable, okay? Um, it's just not. I mean, you don't even know that they're going somewhere else. As long as you're not flipping accounts, it's just very difficult to enforce that. Whereas... If someone's a W-2 employee, it does give a little bit more of that feeling of kind of exclusivity and like I work for this company. So that's that's really crucial. Um, the bigger concern, though, is what kind of accountability are you going to try to enforce? What accountability do you want to enforce uh, with your sales team? Do you want to require them sure. to start working at a certain time uh, each day? Do you want to require them to go to a certain number of businesses a week, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, then again, that's going to lend itself a little bit more towards a W-2 model, right? Um, Right. Then, you know, um, the final question there would be uh, from a legal liability perspective. And this is one where I have a lot of like disagreement with the way that most people in the industry view this. I actually think the W-2 model is better from a liability and risk perspective. And again, I'm not talking to the individual agents right now. I'm not saying it's better for you to be W-2 versus 1099. I'm mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. for if you're starting an ISO. And the reason I right. say that is. The 1099 model opens you up to a lot of unknown variables and risk. You know, sure, um, if somebody, sure. you know, uh, God forbid, slips on a sidewalk and, and hurts themselves um, and they're 1099, well, they could technically sue you and say, well, I was working for them. Well, that's right. going to open up a whole case. Well, were you trying to tell them what to do? Were you, you know, like, da, 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 you know, did you give them company mm -hmm. phone, all this? And, you know, it is very possible they could say, oh, you know what? That person really was an employee. You were treating them like a 1099, but they're really an employee. Well, now... You have to pay for that right. problem. You didn't have workers' comp insurance. Um, and mm -hmm. you don't have to pay for a lot of other things because now they're going to want back payroll taxes, uh, employer payroll taxes for any people you had. So um, so I think it opens it up a little bit. I like the W-2 model as far as it's a known entity. It's like I know the risk that's associated. I have the appropriate insurance to cover it. And and I have that control where I can work with the team and, and motivate them. So, you know, W-2 versus 1099. 1099 is best when you're trying to just get people where all you want to do is you want to accept deals from them. They're going to make sales. They're going to right. send some of those sales to you. Maybe not all of them. Maybe some to somebody else. Exactly. Right. That's right. a that's what an independent contractor is. I mean, by definition. Um, sure. And that's also somebody where they have full ownership as well. There's really, generally speaking, that 1099, you know, wouldn't maybe have as many restrictions on, and not that this always happens in our industry, but they really shouldn't have as many restrictions on ownership of residual and things like that. Generally, 1099, in my opinion, they should have ownership of the portfolio. They should have independence and, and all of that. Then the W-2 is the model where you're generally providing a lot more resources, more support, maybe even some base compensation and things like that. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, then you have that going on. So, um, you know, W-2 versus 1099. I think look at that you know, question a little bit differently. What I'm going to do next week is I'm going to talk about W-2 versus 1099 for the sales rep. And I'm going to talk about it from their perspective. From and their perspective. When they're yeah, choosing right. a processor to work with, which way should they go? And I'll talk about some of the trade-offs uh, from that perspective. Good stuff, James. Thanks. Thanks, Patty. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. You know, I think, I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a year like none other for ISOs and agents, retailers, and consumers. For sure. You know, and while the pandemic won't stop American families from celebrating the year end holidays, it's certainly going to have an impact on where and when consumers spend. Hmm. Yeah, good point. You know, for starters, retailers and consumers alike are gearing up for a longer year end holiday buying season than in years past. Um, hmm. MasterCard, which closely tracks retail sales across all payment types, says the uh, holiday season, shopping season is already underway. And I should I should note that we, we're recording this on November 4th. Right. So, right. Um, you know, that's that's kind of interesting because it used to always be, you know, Black kicked Friday. off with, uh, what do Black you call Friday. it? Uh, Black <clears throat> Friday. Yeah. Yep. 
And uh, now it seems, you know, back in October, in mid-October, there were all these major cyber promotions, you know, mm-hmm. with uh, people trying to, retailers trying to get a head start on the holiday season. Yeah. You know, and so during this new, newly expanded holiday season, which uh, MasterCard is, says runs from, is run, going to run from October 11th to December 24th, uh, and it's called De- MasterCard calls it the 75 days of Christmas. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was wow. Very- Good night. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it is. You know, if you start yeah. doing the math, and that's crazy. Yeah. So they're they're predicting uh, forecasting 2.4 percent growth in total retail sales, excluding automotive and gas, of course, compared to the same period last year, mm-hmm. which is you know. Considering the economic upheaval, I, I was pretty pretty yeah. you know, taken by that. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's a lot better than the economists were suggesting earlier this year. And to put, you know, and also just kind of put it in perspective, back in 2008, the Great Recession, holiday sales fell 3.5% compared to 2007. Okay. Okay, so if they're going to be up 2.4% this year, hmm. Yeah. You know, if you want, I mean, a lot of people, you know, compare this to 2008. I don't think it's as bad as 2008. I'm, I don't, it's just, I it's just very, it's very different. Me. You know what I mean? Like, yes, I think it's a right. lot worse in terms of the impact it's had on our culture and our society as far as just how we live our lives. But I think from, an, from an economic perspective, um, GDP, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, and especially with, you know, the other thing too is when you look at 2008 and you look at, what was done by the government at that time, mm-hmm. the government action at that time was largely focused on saving huge businesses, you know, right. from failing. Whereas right. this time it was more stimulus, CARES Act, small businesses. So there's been and literally then, yeah, big, trillions big, big of dollars pumped on, in, you know. Right. And a big push, you know, this one's been a big push on small business, which is right. what our, you know, what yeah. our people are dealing with. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know? It's not bailing out big banks or automotive companies. Well, they did that too, um, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> this time they just said, as... "Let's." This time they were like, "Let's just do all of it, right?" Like, why not? You know, we have an unlimited right. amount of money. We just print more, and, uh, but that's a whole other topic. Just gotta so. print it. All right. <laughs> uh, so uh, I also have some data from Adobe Analytics. They're okay. predicting Black Friday and some, and some, these numbers are really quite striking for me. Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales this year are going to shatter 2019 records. Really? Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And they're expecting 7.4 billion and 9.4 billion, respectively. And these, of course, are online sales. Right. Um, altogether, uh, Black Friday will generate 10 billion in online sales, according to Adobe. Wow. Uh, Cyber Monday is going to be about 12.7 billion, um, which are increases of in excess of 30 percent for each day, uh, vis-a-vis 2019. Wow, hmm. yeah, that's a lot. That's a, you know, and again, it goes back to what we're saying about a lot more online shopping, obviously. Yep. Um, so, in terms of what consumers are buying this holiday season. It's interesting. It's uh, home furnishings, leisure, and electronics are expected to outperform other sectors, according to MasterCard. What is what is, what is leisure? That, you know, what is think leisure about spending? It. Right, right. <laughs> you know, we're spending more time at home. Um, you know, and the leisure one, I'm you know a little bit off on, but I could see how that would be like. I spend a lot more money on books and music and things like that right sure is that like i wonder um, is that like movie rental like you know renting a movie to watch on, yeah. on apple or exactly something like that? Yeah. yeah i guess that, right. I, I was, I was yeah. asking about, i'm trying to figure out what what leisure spending <laughs> is going to be because obviously yeah. it's not disney world or whatever i mean i'm sure those right. places aren't doing very well yet so you know that's interesting one yeah sure. yeah I, I thought that was you know i thought that was really interesting um so of course, you know, the holiday season is going to look different state to state, family to family. Right. But there are a couple of overarching trends to watch as well as, uh, you know, congressional uh, factors like congressional action on stimulus. Right. Oh, know, of course. That, That'll be huge if that's, yeah, if something comes Yeah, that's that. going to have a huge impact on things right. if, if that if that ever comes to fruition. Sure. Yeah. Um, hmm. But here's a few additional insights. You know me, I have to, have, you know, I'm always looking for data points. Sure, so. got to have the data. <laughs> yeah. From, from both MasterCard and Adobe. Uh, e-commerce sale bro- growth is going to be 
you know, pretty, ex pretty extensive. Adobe expects online sales to exceed $2 billion a day between November 1st and November 21st. Wow. Then, then, then jump to $3 billion a day uh, between December, November 22 and December 3. Wow. And by the time the books are closed on 2020, the e-commerce share of overall retail sales will jump to 20%. Hmm. That's up from 14% in 2019, according to, according to uh, MasterCard. You know, to me, if you're selling small business owners today <clears throat> and you do not have not, some right. kind of solution to help them go online, whether that's online ordering, if it's a restaurant or e-commerce, if it's retail, I mean, I don't know what to tell you're you at this point. Boat. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a yeah. huge opportunity. I just, I can't, cannot imagine being out there and not selling online right now. Yeah. It's just something um, that everybody, you know, the, especially after the COVID-19 stuff and all that. I mean, you know, merchants right. now more than ever realize they need to modernize their business and get online. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, great you know, stuff. Pat. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, a few other points here among consumers who are still shopping brick and mortar. Right. Um, uh, they're, you know, going to be uh, spending a lot more at small local stores instead of venturing out to malls and big box stores. Really? And, uh, well, no, that's yeah, interesting. That's, that's a good data point for our listeners. That's a really excellent data point for, for our guys. And, and uh, it's a phenomenon the MasterCard refers to as the shrinking retail radius. But, huh. and, and, okay. I, and I actually can see this, James. You know, I mean, when I'm going places... If I, you know, I go out, I don't go out every day. And when I do, it's sort of like, okay, I'm going into Frederick. That's the town near me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into Frederick and, okay, while I'm there, I can stop at this place, this place, and this place. Right. And, you know, they're, they're small machine. You know, I have to get a new chainsaw. I go to a, I go to the local guy. I don't go to the big box store. Because I also, it's part of wanting to keep these guys in business. Right. I think a lot right. of us. You know, we're home more. We're seeing what those local businesses are going through. Yeah. And we're trying to do our part to help them. Yeah. Now, Patty, I just have to break yeah. for one moment here to say that I know our listeners would love to see a video of you with a chainsaw. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they would. <laughs> oh, people crack up, but it is, you know, I live out, I have five acres. I have to go out there and cut things up. Yeah. I've been known to cut down a few trees too. That's I've actually great. been known to. Uh, hook a tree to the back of my truck and pull it down. Wow. Yeah. This, this, these are all great moments that we need to capture for our audience. So uh, sometime yeah. I'll put together a video for everybody. Yeah, Patty, video Patty on the farm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. So, yeah, so, but anyway, yeah, I think, you know, and just one last data point, which shouldn't surprise anybody, you know, airlines, luxury hotels and hospitality companies are going to continue to be hard hit. Yes. Especially because many families are just, going to be staying home for the holidays yeah yeah not not surprising yeah. at all there so well good data points though about small businesses and hopefully that comes to fruition so yeah, uh, yeah you know not so. yeah interesting interesting stuff so as always patty thank you for the insights sure thing james this episode of the merchant sales podcast was brought to you by valor paytech the technology company that is revolutionizing cash discounting and surcharging with innovative features like dual mid support waive the fee options, and even adding non-cash adjustment charges to tips. Now, all of this is made possible by a variety of technology devices and solutions such as gateways, tabletop point of sale devices, and features like SMS text messaging and e-invoicing, all with cash discounting in mind. Valor Paytech, bold ideas, smart execution, make sure you head over to ccsalespro.com slash valor, V-A-L-O-R, ccsalespro.com slash valor, V-A-L-O-R. Schedule your free demo today and watch videos and learn more about this amazing technology solution. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of greensheet.com and ccsalespro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.